Can everybody hear me okay? Well, thanks a lot. I, really good to be here. I appreciate it. And I also used to live in Grand Rapids a few years ago in a previous time in my career, so it's really good to be back in familiar territory. And I know we're on a tight schedule, so I'm going to keep probably looking at a clock or a watch just to make sure I'm on track as I go through. Um, this is a real challenge for me to try to get uh, you know, peak oil covered in such a short time. But I'm going to go ahead and, and go by Aaron's assumption that most of the people here have a pretty good understanding already of what the concept is, kind of what we're facing. Um, and are, are pretty well informed to begin with. And so I think what I'm going to do today is just pr pr provide some, maybe some highlights, you know, by way of review, just to kind of remind us of, of what some of the key aspects are of this whole uh, very important concept. And also, I had the, the good fortune recently last month of attending the American Society, or the Association for the Study of Peak Oil and Gas, ASPO, as, as a lot of you know, the organization. Um, they had their national conference in Washington in October. And I wanted to go there just for my own learning, you know, to be around the experts, to hear what was going on. Um, I saw Kurt Cobb in the room earlier, so he was there. Um, Nicole Foss, who we'll hear from later, was, was there as a speaker, gave a really good presentation, so I'm excited she's going to be here sharing some of her ideas. Um, but basically what I would like to do is maybe drop some of the things uh, to you today that I picked up from that uh, conference. So again, it was kind of you know, cutting edge what, what the leading thinkers are, are uh, thinking today. And I myself am still learning about this. And so um, I'm kind of you know, giving this presentation with that spirit. So just uh, the first thing I want to point out that was really driven home again and again was it's all about the flow rate of oil out of the ground and into the, the global economy. We all know there's you know, trillions of, of barrels of hydrocarbon still in the crust of the earth. Um, we're going to get a lot of that um, going forward, but it's about how quickly you can do that and, and how much that, that's able to support the current metabolism of the, of the society that we run. That's the whole question. So again and again, it came back to that. What are some of these issues, these factors affecting the flow rate of the hydrocarbons coming out of the ground? Um, most of you have probably seen this picture, and basically it's showing, going way back into the last century, uh, first of all, the, the discovery trend. So the blue bars are all the annual discoveries of oil. This is conventional oil. Um, and as you see, back in the 1960s was when it reached its peak, and it's been going downhill ever since. Not for lack of trying, because we've had you know, advances in, in uh, petroleum geology, the knowledge of where to find the stuff. Um, technology has, has really become much better. So we've, we've had a lot more to apply to the process, and this is just you know, the result. And then the, the gold bars are the extrapolation going forward. Um, the red line is the annual production, and that's the rate of flow annually of how quickly we're pulling this out of the ground. And you want to pay attention to where the red line starts to cross the blue bar back in the 1980s and has been um, you know, widening ever since, that gap. And that's important because today we're finding about uh, one barrel of oil to replace every three that we use. So we basically have had this big stock of oil that we found in the past, and we're drawing that down on a steady basis of three to one every year at this point. Some people think it's even higher, four to one, maybe even five to one. So that trend is not getting better, and we're, we're really on borrowed time in, in, in that regard. Um, on top of that, we have to worry about the fields that we already produce from are depleting on an average of about 5% per year globally. Now, if you think about where the oil is coming from, there's about 70,000 fields around the world that are producing oil, the vast majority of which are very small. Um, and so what happens is we tend to rely, if you look at this table, um, it's showing uh, kind of how the split out of, of production from the different classes of wells. By far, we rely on, on a very small number of large and very extremely large oil fields to get most of our petroleum. Um, 110 wells provide half of our oil, and of that population, 20 uh, alone have provided a quarter of what we get. The problem is many of those large, big fields, those are, um, they're old, they're mature, they're depleting. And when this data from the, uh, the International Energy Agency was compiled um, in 2007, 16 of those 20 largest fields are already depleting. They are already past their own peak. And so that's, that's another factor that we have to worry about in terms of the flow of oil. 
On top of that, not only are we using more than we're replacing through discovery, what we have is depleting. We have this you know, increasing demand. And what I've got here uh, in this slide, hot off the presses this week, the International Agen Energy Agency released their annual outlook of, of, uh, for world energy for 2010. And what this slide is showing is basically just the, the constant pressure and demand going up over around the world for drivers. You know, basically you've got countries like China and India that are going to be taking most of the new demand going forward. And you've got over a billion people in the world who want to become car drivers and car owners. And they've got the money to do it. And that's the, that's the pressure that we're going to be facing going forward. They talked at the conference uh, a lot about the very, various different factors um, about why we have this problem, why, why we're facing these issues. There are a lot of factors that they refer to as above ground, things related to you know, economic rest uh, restrictions, um, preventing more flow, um, geopolitical restrictions. But what I want to talk about for a little bit here is just to kind of review for all of us what, we, what we've probably heard about the below ground factors, the geology. And I want to start just with a, a slide that shows a couple of, you know, just to remind us what oil is, where it comes from, what, the, what it actually looks like underground. It comes in the form of rock formations that are porous that hold the liquid oil. And so the point here, you know, looking at these microscopic images is just to remind us that this is a physical system. It has, you know, physical parameters, physical constraints, and you can only get something out of this, you know, you can only make it work within certain, certain um, you know, restrictions of physics and chemistry. So we have to keep that in mind. The resource pyramid concept is a very helpful one for me to understand kind of the, the issue in general. So the pyramid, uh, if you'll assume, is just all the hydrocarbons that are out there for us to go get on the planet. And it turns out that on top of the pyramid is the easy stuff. It's close to the surface. It, it flows very easily. It's under high pressure. And it was easy to get. We went after that first, of course, and uh, in the spirit of getting the low-hanging fruit. And what happens is when that's depleting, you have to start going down the pyramid to the different uh, resources that are not so easy to get. As you go down through that pyramid, what you notice is that there's actually more resource. There's a lot more tar sand hydrocarbon out there than there was you know, some of the really easy close to the surface resource. But the point about the flow is that as you go down through that pyramid, even though there's more stuff out there to get, it's harder because it's more uh, energy intensive, more extractive, more expensive, and that's really important. A lot of people don't get this really you know, basic distinction. The, uh, the folks at the conference also came back to this um, topic quite a bit, energy return on energy invested. And it's really important, and it, and it kind of follows directly from the resource pyramid concept. As you go down through that resource pyramid, you're having to spend more energy to get every unit of energy out that you're enjoying in, in your economy. And basically what this picture shows, very simply, the blue line um, is conventional oil production through history. On average, back in, say, the 1930s, we were, for every barrel of oil spent in the process, getting 100 out of that process. So basically 99 barrels were available for the economy to do other things. Over time, you know, the easy stuff went away, so we had to go offshore, we had to go deeper, we had to put more energy into the process. Um, by 1970, we were getting 30 back from every barrel invested, and now today we're down around 20, 22. So that's, you know, 21 barrels available for the rest of the economy now as opposed to 99 before. It's a big difference, even though we're producing more today. And then for a comparison there, if you look at tar sands, um, these are, this is data I took from a group that came out with a study in May saying that just to get the stuff out of the, uh, out of the ground and get it in the form for processing is a 7 to 1 payback. And by the time you do all the thorough refining and get it to market, you're already down to 3 to 1. Um, you know, I'm not sure what these if these numbers are, you know, what assumptions went into them, but the point is you know, the trend line for energy return is down, and that's a problem if we want to keep running the, the kind of metabolism in our society that we, that we have come to um, expect. 